Hello and welcome to the Physics 262 pre-lecture lab for spring 2015. My name is Dr. James Rawl and we'll be talking today about paths between states and how the different paths you can get different properties for. So the topics we're going to be covering today are how do we define a state, what are state variables, and we're going to look at a specific example for a state equation. Then we're going to next determine how much work is done by a system when changing from one state to another. And then we'll talk about the different processes by which we can change the state, either keeping certain state variables constant or having them change. And then we will talk about the different paths we can take between states and see what is different between path 1 and path 2. So let's to to begin with, we need to define what a state is. So if you ever go in for a yearly physical, usually the doctors will take some macroscopic measurements and also microscopic measurements. So some of the macroscopic ones are the ones like the heart rate, breathing capacity, um, if he puts you on an exercise machine like he did here, then he'll measure a couple of different quantities based on that stress level. He may also look at microscopic properties like if he orders blood work. So if your doctor orders blood work and is looking at your cholesterol, maybe thyroid level or some other indication, so that's a microscopic uh, measurement. And so it's the same thing with thermodynamic states. Is that for a system, a thermodynamic system, we can identify these different state variables, variables for it. For example, we can talk about the pressure or the volume or the temperature. We can also talk about the number of molecules, but that's usually related to the volume. But that's another one that we can talk about is mass and the number or the number of atoms. So usually we've actually been looking at state variables in the last couple lectures, spe specifically changing the phase of a matter. That is when we're going from solid to liquid to gas phases. And usually we indicate this idea of connection between pressure, temperature, and the phase by a phase diagram. And the phase diagram that we use is, in this case, look at here, we have pressure versus temperature. Right? So usually when we talk about phase diagrams, it's going to be pressure and temperature at least for the phase of matter. You could also have different phases, for example, uh, magnetic phase transitions, and so there you would probably have the magnetic field versus temperature. But we're going to limit ourselves to thermodynamic states today. So for, uh, so even though we've looked at the phase diagram with just pressure and temperature, we now know that also volume changes. And so we would actually have a three-dimensional graph that looks something like this for a phi phase diagram. However, when we look at this, it's a little bit hard to determine, okay, what are these lines? Uh, what does it look, at, look like at a specific temperature? And so that's where the idea of having the phase diagram of P versus T, but now we're actually going to be, usually when we talk about states and thermodynamic states, now we're actually going to be looking at what are known as PV diagrams. And so here's an example of a PV diagram, and here are certain temperatures that are plotted. So here are different temperatures. So if you have, for example, a certain volume, let's say right here, and you have a pressure that's over here, then you say, okay, well that state is indicated by this point, and it has the temperature equal to whatever T4 is. So these variables, remember, are our state variables. And so the next part is, okay, now that we identified P and V and T, and we have our PV diagram, well, how do, in equation form, how do we relate the pressure, volume, and temperature? And so if you think back, uh, so that's what's known as a state equation. So a state equation relates the state variables 
to one another. And so if you think back to high school chemistry, is that you'll remember the ideal gas law has all of these ideas. So it has both pressure, volume, and temperature with it. But remember also back from high school chemistry that the ideal gas law is only valid in certain regions. And so we're going to be looking at low pressures and far from a phase transition, far from where it goes from a gas to a liquid or a gas to a solid. So to actually get the state equation, you'll remember that PV is equal to NRT. So this is the ideal gas law you saw in high school, in your high school chemistry class. So the question is then, how can we actually change our state from one system to another system? Sorry, not necessarily we're changing the system, but we're changing the state in our system. So here we have a system. We have some molecules in some volume which has a pressure and it has a temperature. And so this little guy over here, so he represents actually what's known as your environment. And so the environment is putting pressure or putting force onto this plate. And so the environment is putting a force this direction. Whereas the molecules inside of our system or inside of this box, they're going to be coming and hitting this force or this plate. And when they do that, they're imparting some type of force onto that plate or some type of pressure. So our system actually creates a force that's in this direction. It's always pointing outward from the box, whereas the en environment's always pushing inward. So if we actually change the state, let's say we um, we're able to apply a force environment that's greater than the force of the system and so therefore it's going to be shrinking the box and so now you can see now we have a different temperature and we have a different pressure and also a different volume for our system and so we have essentially changed the state of our system it is important to note remember we had it initially all the way out here so our displacement is this direction and the environmental force is also in the same direction so the work done if we wanted to find the work done by the environment in this direct in this way it would be a positive number whereas the force due to the system is pointing to the left and the displacement is pointing to the right so in this case the work done by the system is going to be negative And so we can even do the same thing if we have our initial state here and then we increase the volume, we change what the temperature and what the pressure is. So let's now le actually look at a PV diagram with an initial and a final state and figure out how much work it takes to for the system, the work done by the system, to go from that initial state to that final state. And so if you remember back from Physics 161, the work here is the integral of f dot dx. Now remember that for pressure, all these little air molecules or gas molecules are going to hit the, the plate and they're going to create a pressure on it. And the pressure that they create is related to their force over the area of of your object. And so if we solve this equation for what the force is, we see that it's pressure times area. And so we incorporate that in. And so you'll recognize here that if you have a box and you do some small displacement delta x, well now you're actually changing the volume. And so this is how much volume change you have, so dV. And so that's the simple equation for the work done by the system. And so you can see since we're dealing with an integral is that we're going to actually be looking at the area under a curve when we do a PV diagram. And that's going to give us how much work is done by the system. So it's important to note though, since we're going from a lower volume to a higher volume, 
the work done by the system is going to be positive and the work done by the environment is negative. However, if we went the opposite where we went from a larger volume to a smaller volume, then the work done by the system will be negative and the work done by the environment now is positive. So let's look at an example of this. So here we're going to be heating a gas at a constant pressure. So we have two moles of an ideal gas and they're being heated at constant pressure from 27 degrees Celsius to 107 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we want to do is draw a PV diagram for this process and that way we at least get a visual of what the work done is going to look like. And then we're going to calculate the work done by the gas. So the PV diagram looks something like this. So you have just a simple horizontal line going from your initial state of 27 degrees C to your final state over here of 107 degrees C. And so here's our work equation and you notice that here pressure is constant so if we have a constant inside the integral we can pull it out. And so now it only depends on the integral of dV and if you remember from calculus class the integral of something like du is just going to be equal to the u final minus u initial. And so this equation is actually valid for all problems that deal with constant pressure. So anytime you have a constant pressure you can automatically jump down to this equation. But now the question is, well, we don't, we're not given pressure and we're not given volume, so how is it that we're going to be able to solve this? All we have are these two different temperatures and that we have two moles of the ideal gas. Well, this is where we go to the state equation and see if we can relate some of the pressures and the volumes together with these temperatures. And so for the first pressure is going to be uh, related to the ratio of the temperature and the volume. And the second pressure is the same. But remember, uh, if we look over here again at our PV diagram, that the pressures are actually equal. So P1 is equal to P2, which is equal to P. And so we get a relationship something like this if we set P1 equal to P2. And we can even do this a step further and say that V2 over V1 is going to be equal to T2 over T1. So now you can see, now we have a ratio of volumes and then we have what the pressure is in terms of volume. So let's go ahead and substitute that into our work equation. So here we took the pressure and we imported it here or actually it might be better to say we imported it here so that's where that term comes from and now let's go ahead and factor the V1 th through so we're gonna put V1 over here and divide that one by V1 and so we get something like this so you see here now this is our ratio of V2 over V1 remember V2 over V1 is equal to T2 over T1 And so you put that in and you come out actually when you distribute T1 into this equation that it's actually equal to the number of moles, R is a constant, and then the r difference between the temperature. And so you plug in the number here, we have two moles, R is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, and the temperature goes from 380 to 300. Remember to change temperature from degrees Celsius to Kelvin is that you're going to add sorry about that, you are going to add 273. Okay. So 273 plus 27 gives you the 300, 273 plus 107 gives you the 380. You also want to make sure that you're very particular here that you look at what units you're using for R because R can vary depending on what units you're using, for example, energy, or for if you're looking at moles, or if you're doing Boltzmann's constant. But you should also note that the change in temperature for one degree C is equal to one Kelvin. So we could have actually done the difference between the degree Celsius and it would have came out with the same answer, but the units may have looked a little bit funny. So let's go ahead and now look at another problem Oh, so here's our final answer, right? I put all the numbers in, I don't give you the final answer. So here it is, the work done when you have 
two moles of an ideal gas heated from 27 to 107 is 149 kilojoules. And since we're going from low volume to high volume, this is how much work the system is doing to r when you raise that temperature. And you can take this work and turn it into mechanical energy. And that's essentially how engines work. But we'll look a little bit more at engines, or maybe you'll see it in some other thermodynamics classes that you are that you take in the near future. So let's go ahead and look at another example. Here we're compressing a gas now with a constant temperature. So again, we're going to be looking at two moles at a constant temperature of 65 degrees. And so we want to know what's the work done going from the original pressure up to triple the pressure. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to actually sketch the PV diagram and then calculate the amount of work. So here is what the sketch looks like. So this is what's known as an isothermal or an isotherm. So an isotherm tells you what the ideal gas is going to the path the ideal gas is going to do if it has constant temperature. And so this is the isotherm. And remember this P2 up here is now going to be equal to 3 P1. So we're tripling the pressure. So remember the work done is the integral of P dV. So now this time since P actually is not constant, it's going to change, it's going to be to three times, we need to figure out how P is related to the volume so that way we can get these limits of integration and also we can put in what the pressure is there. So again this is where we go back to our state equation so now you see why that state equation is so important and we see that the PV is equal to nRT so again we're gonna say okay P1 V1 is equal to nRT remember T1 is a constant so temperature is a constant and that's gonna be equal also to P2 V2 and so we get this relation of P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2 and so if you triple the pressure what you have to do is actually reduce the volume by a third. So we're reducing it to a third of what it originally was. So that actually gives us the limit of integration and then we're going to use in, we're going to substitute in this relation for the pressure. So we're going to put that relation here into pressure. And we're going to use this one to figure out what the limits of our integration is going to be. So we're going to start at V1 and then we are going to three times the pressure or one-third times the volume. So one-third the volume. And then we're going to substitute in what the pressure is. And so when you take the, remember when you do an integral of 1 over U du, that's equal to the natural log of U evaluated from your initial state to your final state. And this can also be written, well, I'll show you what it is here. So the natural log of one-third times the volume, so that's our final, minus the natural log of V1. And remember, when you have the natural log of X minus natural log of Y, remember this goes comes back from your math in your high school. And so you have a difference of the natural logs, and that's the same thing as dividing. So you have natural log of X divided by Y. And so that's essentially what I'm going to be doing here. And so you see that the initial volumes actually cancel each other out. And now you have a simple work equation that relates the number of moles and the temperature when you triple the pressure. And so you put in numbers here. Again, you want to make sure that you're converting to kelvins. And so you get the work done as 2.06 kilojoules. And actually, there's an error here, because remember, there is a negative here. So this should also be negative, which, remember, goes with our sign. It goes from, since we're going from large volume to small volume, the work done by the system is going to be negative. Okay, So that's an error there. Make sure you take note that the work is negative in this case. So even though we've been dealing with compressing and tripling the pressure, usually that's done by a mechanical sense. You have some type of piston that you put pressure on and that changes the volume or changes the pressure. But there's other ways to actually change the state 
of a system. And so one of the ways is actually using a magnetic field, and this is known as the magnetocaloric effect. And so this is uh, a system that uses this magnetocaloric effect to actually refrigerate or keep cool, let's say, your um, Coors Light beer bottle here. And so what happens is you put a magnet, uh, you take a magnet and you rotate it in and out of this, so it's going to be going this direction in and out. And every time you do that, you actually reduce the temperature of your system, and which thereby cools off your beer. So you can think about this next time you're out tailgating to bring a, bring a magnet and bring some of this uh, magnetocaloric material to keep your beer warm. You don't even need electricity in this case. And so that's one way is through a magnetic field, but you also have um, electricity that can also change the state of a system. And this is known as the thermoelectric effect. And so what you have here, so we'll actually focus a little bit on this, is that if you put a current through some of these materials, what you can do is you can actually cool the inside of a container because you're now inducing a change in temperature from the outside to the inside of your, of your system. And this is, uh, cooling using this current is actually very common when you have um, I think they have car refrigerators that you plug into the cigarette lighters and that's essentially what you're doing is putting a current through and then you're cooling down the the topic or your your inside uh, material but you can also use it the other way is that if you have a difference in temperature is that now you can actually create current to flow through this and I actually worked on a few of this with a company that I worked on in uh, in Phoenix and so what the idea is is that you have these devices and they're trying to create devices that can actually run at different temperatures and different uh, temperature gradients and so that's the main research that's in the thermoelectric effect at least right now or thermoelectric uh, companies is that they're putting money into researching how to actually make it so that way you can actually put them on something like a smokestack so you would put the smokestack these on the smokestack here and so you have a big high temperature gradient between inside the smokestack and outside and so that gives you that temperature change and then you can create electricity just by having that smoke going through or that steam going through your electrical power plant and so you create an additional uh, electricity and increase the efficiency of your power plants that way. You can also do it with an automobile system is that here you have an exhaust system which has very high temperature gas flowing through it and again once you're gonna what you're gonna do is you're gonna line the vehicle up with all these different um, devices and it's gonna create electricity for your car and you can save that electricity pump it into your battery um, put it wherever you need it and so this the idea of at least this one is also to get away from an alternator and to replace it with some of these thermal electric effects so that way you're actually propagating what the engine is um, outputting and putting it back into elect, uh, putting it back into the battery rather than having the alternator recharge your battery. So that's sort of a side note. So let's actually get back to this idea of changing states with thermodynamics or thermo systems. And so the, we actually want to identify different processes and what the work done by each and what variables are changing in the processes. So there are four main processes that we're going to be looking at. One is isobaric, where we have constant pressure. We have isothermal, which is constant temperature. So we looked at an example for both of these. Uh, isochoric means that we have a constant volume. And then adiabatic, which we haven't really gone through, but basically it's an isolated system. Meaning, for example, an isolated system is a very good approximation is putting coffee into a styrofoam cup. If you hold that styrofoam cup, there's very little heat that's transferred to your hand from that coffee. And so that's sort of an, it, whatever you do with that coffee, it would be an adiabatic process. But we're actually probably won't look too much at the adiabatic process uh, in, in this chapter. So for an isobaric process, remember we have constant pressure but the volume, when the volume increases, also the temperature will also increase. And if you decrease the volume, we do de decrease the temperature. So they're directly related. And you should remember that 
the work is the area under the curve, so the work here is this, and remember that's going to be equal to P times V final minus V initial, right? For an isothermal process, just like we talked about before, we have constant temperature, but now when the pressure increases, the volume actually decreases. And when you decrease the pressure, you increase the volume. So they're inversely. And again, remember here, this is the work done. And we actually came up, remember, with an ideal gas when we have an isothermal process, which is nRT times by the natural log of V2 over V1. So let's actually move on from an isothermal process to an isochoric process. So this is where the volume actually is constant. And so if you have constant volume, then your pressure, when your pressure increases, your temperature also increases. When your pressure decreases, your temperature decreases. But you should actually notice here that since the volume is the same, dV now is going to be zero, and so therefore your work done by your system is zero. So that's actually pretty easy when you have an isochoric process to find the work done. So now that we've identified those four processes, let's see if you can actually, oh, I forgot one more, adiabatic. So for the adiabatic, all three of our state variables actually change. And so here is the path that a uh, adiabatic process takes going from a low temperature to a high temperature, high volume to a low volume. And again, we won't really be dealing with this too much in this course. So let's see if you can actually identify what some of these are. So let's go ahead and see if you can take the letters the, of the different processes and match them up with the names of the process. So go ahead and take a few minutes, and we'll probably review this in class. But I'll continue on so that way we can get through a little bit more material, the last section here, which is the paths between two states. So the path between two states is actually, there's an infinite number of paths that you can actually take. And so, for example, here is one path, or you can do a direct path, right, an adiabatic direct path. And these are all going to uh, change the amount of work done by the environment and the system. So here are two paths. So one is you have an isochoric process and then you have an isobaric process. And then path two is now you do the isobaric first and then isochoric after. And so remember that here the work for the isochorics are going to be zero and the work done by other ones is actually these boxes. So let me actually go ahead and put this one in red. So that would be if you're path one. So that's how much work for path one the system is doing. But what if you are using path two? Well, this is now going to be the amount of work you have. Sorry about that. So we're almost finished here, so let's see if we can finish up. So that's the amount of work that we have for path two. So you can see that if we actually take path two, we get more work out of our system, which is the reason why we probably wanted to do an isobaric process first and then an isochoric process. So let's go ahead and look at this process again. So let's talk about maybe now a cyclic process. So let's say before, let's say if we went path two and then we took path one in reverse order, then what amount of work would we actually do? So the amount of work that we actually do, so remember this is gonna be positive work because we're going to a higher volume. And then we have a negative work here when we do C, and remember since D and B are isochoric, then this is zero, the work here is zero. And so you can see that the work actually that we do here, let me go ahead and highlight this, is gonna be how much area is in this rectangle. So however much area is in this rectangle is the amount of work that our system is gonna do on the environment. 
And so that's how we get our engines that are able to propel our vehicles. Is that they go through a process like this, which the system is now going to output some type of work that we put into mechanical energy. So let's look at an example here, and we're actually sort of running a little bit long, so I'm going to cut this a little bit short, but we'll look at this a little bit more in class. You can go ahead and get started. So the graph to the right shows a PV diagram of the air in a human lung when a person is inhaling and then exhaling a deep breath. So we want to know how much of the, what's the net work that this person does in order to complete the breath. So go ahead and see if you can uh, if you can go ahead and solve this, I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of a tip here. And the tip is that you want to make sure that you're using pressure that's in pascals. So you're going to have to convert millimeters of mercury to pascals. And you're going to have to convert liters to cubic meters. And so essentially remember what we Remember what we talked about previously about the about the area inside of our cyclic process is the amount of work done by the system. And so you're going to want to find what the area is here. And that's how much work is done by the system. And then you have to figure out how much work is then done by the person's lung. So that would be the work done by the air that they breathe in and not necessarily what they do. So I hope you enjoy this video for talking about the different paths between thermodynamic states. And we will see you in class.